be advised that this recorded webinar has been edited from its original format, which may have included a product demo. To set up a live demo or to request more information, please complete the form to the right. Or if you are currently not on CSC Global, there is a link to the website in the description of this video. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Business Life Cycle Compliance, Keeping Your Entities and Licenses in Check. My name is Annie Tribaletti, and I will be your moderator. Joining us today are David Jeffries and Brian Bartnicki. David is a product manager for compliance and governance services at CSC in the Wilmington, Delaware headquarters office. With CSC for over 13 years, he has significant experience providing training, implementation, and consultative services to clients of CSC entity management and consults with those evaluating CSC matter management solutions. Brian is the business license sales engineer at the forefront, assisting customers with their industry-specific requirements, which range from research, portfolio management, and renewal services. Brian has worked with CSC for more than a decade, offering his expertise in the field of license compliance. And with that, let's welcome David and Brian. Great. Thank you, Annie. We're both very excited to be here. We have what we think is going to be a uh, very informative uh, webinar for our audience. We're really excited to, to share a lot of content and, and take some questions as well. But, uh, you know, Brian, I think I might just kind of kick things over to you to get us started. Thanks, David. So for everyone on the line you know, here at CSC, for those of you who did not know, we've been around for quite some time. I always like to joke that we've been around for three centuries and two millennium, that we've been around since 1899 which I find you know, amazing and I'm very proud to say that um, our organization has been around for that period of time. Uh, but we provide services in uh, many different ways for all different types of companies. And uh, those range from people in the financial world, uh, people in the corporate world, people uh, that have more digital presence, whether it be brands or um, largest brands in the world, some of the smallest companies to the largest companies. In some capacity, we provide services to to 90% of the Fortune 500, as well as some of uh, over uh, 100 thousands of law firms um, throughout the country. So our, our network of customers is, is quite uh, expansive. Uh, no matter who you are and where you are around the world, uh, CSC is able to help. And it's really why our our you know sort of our motto here is, is the business behind business. And David and I are very proud and really happy to spend some time with you. Uh, for the remainder of the day. I'd like to actually go over the agenda before we kind of dive into the meat and potatoes of the webinar. Uh, we're going to really go into the current state of the market, uh, especially with everything going on in the world. You know, how is that sort of affecting businesses? What are some of the uh, trends or sort of uh, sort of mindsets that companies are having based on some, some studies that David will show? We're then going to dive into some of the uh, responsibilities that many of you might have as it pertains to the entities that you're managing or business licenses. And you know, we'll dive deeper into that, but those are going to be the industry specific licenses, you know, outside of the Secretary of State. Following that, we'll go into some of the challenges of compliance management, you know, how you juggle all of these with every all the hats you're putting on throughout your day. Then we're going to move to best practices and really talk about you know how you should think um, and really what should, you know, trigger actions based on what's going on um, through the life of a business. Um, and, and really ultimately at the end, you know, how CSC can help. Uh, and David and I will, will dive into the services that we can assist with, you know, after we go over um, sort of the meat and potatoes of the webinar. Uh, but again, we greatly appreciate your time. And I'll turn it over to David to uh, start with our first uh, bullet point here. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. And certainly the, the bulk of the webinar, as Brian kind of took us to the agenda, we'll focus on uh, what I would call the day-to-day the -day stuff, the folks that we talk to day in, day out that are on the front lines managing compliance, whether that's you know, entities, litigation, licenses, and that's really the kind of the lens that we'll take for the bulk of the webinar. But we did want to start with a little bit of kind of the, the current environment, uh, because ultimately uh, these, I'll call them the larger market forces, do have a trickle-down effect in terms of what they mean for the activities of the businesses that uh, the folks on the line uh, ultimately, you know, help support. So let's talk about the kind of the state of the business world prior to 2020. And so if you take a look at some of the statistics that are shown here, uh, really 2018 and 2019 
uh, were, you know, the third and fourth highest years ever for mergers and acquisitions. And I think, you know, ultimately, you know, M&A or mergers and acquisitions is a good measure of sort of the level of activity around uh, kind of transactions and, and, and deals that are happening, you know, kind of in, in the space where we are. And uh, you might step back and say, well, you know, why do we suspect there were so many, you know, mergers and acquisitions in those years? And uh, ultimately, you know, a business, whether it's privately held or if it's a publicly held company, you know, ultimately what they're trying to do is, is grow in terms of revenue and, and profitability and value. Um, and to try to do that organically, where you're just going to kind of you know, keep doing what you're doing and, and look to grow over time, uh, in many cases, it could take years or decades to, you know, to double your value, which is a goal that a lot of companies will put forward. And a merger is often a, a quick way to rapidly increase market share and drive profitability and revenue and kind of, you know, outpace competitors. So uh, certainly not only do we see an incredible volume of deals in those years, uh, but also you'll see here in one of the bullets that the private equity firms that drive a lot of investment were sitting on a mountain of cash. So it looked like all signs were pointing towards 2020 being yet another year where there'd be a really a high volume of transactions and, and activity in the market. And then obviously uh, things changed where uh, we're now in the midst of a pandemic, sort of uh, a once every hundred years uh, situation. And uh, clearly you can see that M&A volume has dropped uh, precipitously for the first part of 2020. And I'm not going to pretend that we have the answers to know what happens next. That said, uh, we are looking to, you know, some experts kind of in the space uh, who have done a little bit of analysis to try to make somewhat of an educated guess in terms of where we might kind of go from here as we hopefully start to dig ourselves out from uh, hopefully what was the worst of the, uh, the pandemic. And so interestingly, um, in, in this market study, they looked at uh, the last 30 years and when there were Kind of event-driven changes that cause M&A to drop. So whether it's you know, something like the housing crisis, uh, where it wasn't just something that was cyclical, where obviously like markets grow and they shrink over time, uh, it wasn't sort of those types of trends, but really where something happened that caused M&A to drop, which is clearly where we are today. Uh, and what the studies indicate from Goldman Sachs is that in those circumstances, the market seemed to kind of snap back fairly quickly, and M&A starts to kind of come back. Uh, you know, faster than it would if it were just some sort of a cyclical downturn. The other things that the Goldman Sachs study predicts, the study predicts is kind of interesting where they're talking about sort of three waves of M&A activity that we might start to see. One is not what you'd want to see, but kind of that involuntary where there are organizations that are unable to kind of weather uh, the, the kind of the, the market that we're in today with, with the recession and uh, unfortunately are looking to sell off assets because they're kind of, a, you know, end of life, so to speak. The other is uh, what we're calling near in m a where effectively these are organizations that are looking to get creative, whether it's partnerships, joint ventures, to effectively see their way through uh, and get to the other side, so to speak. And then there is sort of another audience here. You could call these folks opportunistic, perhaps, uh, where effectively they're saying, you know, in the midst of this crisis, let's see where there may be opportunity to sort of expand geographically, get into adjacent markets, uh, and try to maybe uh, – you know, take take an opportunity here through the crisis to sort of strengthen our position moving forward as we eventually get out of the pandemic. So those are sort of the predictions that Goldman Sachs is kind of uh, showing for the types of activity we could see uh, in the near term. The final sort of market analysis that we'll share here comes from a Harvard Business Review. And the first bullet point I think will probably resonate with a lot of folks, and that's effectively that, you know, just over half of organizations kind of hit the pause button on the number of the deals that they were working on, where effectively – you know, the one thing that the market really doesn't like is uncertainty, and that's sort of what we have in spades right now, where we just kind of don't know what's going to happen. So a lot of organizations are saying, let's just kind of sit and wait and, and, again, press pause on some of these deals. That said, you'll see a little bit further below in the orange bullet that despite that, a lot of organizations are saying, you know, what, it, we still can maybe at a slower pace look to expand geographically or into other markets where it does make sense to strengthen our business. And then certainly there are some folks that are looking to divest and maybe uh, kind of change the mix of their, their structures. But uh, again, definitely a, a slowdown. Uh, obviously, we're seeing that across the board, but still uh, organizations are looking for those opportunities where it makes sense to partner and acquire to uh, move forward. So again, we understand that these, again, sort of larger market forces certainly have a trickle down effect on kind of the day-to-day -day work that a lot of the folks that we deal with uh, are facing. And so with that, uh, Brian, I'm going to kind of transition over to you to take us into kind of, you know, what does that day-to-day -day world look like for folks that are managing things like entities and licenses? Thanks, David. So, you know, when I talk to companies, there's kind of two two lines of, you know, thought, so to speak. You know, there's 
people that are managing, you know, sort of formations, amendments, dissolving companies. But then, you know, there's sort of the left hand and the right hand, and you know, Dave will dive into this further, further, further throughout the presentation. Uh, but then you have those industry-specific licenses. Um, sometimes those might be handled by people in the tax department, whereas your legal department might, might really handle amendments, dissolutions, formations, um, anything pertaining to kind of the legal entity structure. Um, and then the, you really dive into kind of the, the maintenance of those. You know, maybe you're maintaining minute books or um, org charts, things of that nature. And then some of you uh, might have situations where you have to set aside additional time uh, when you're going into new jurisdictions. You know, one of the items that we showed on the, sort of the prior slide is that there are companies that are looking to get into new markets, maybe using it as, as an opportunity to do so. So, you know, what does it look like um, you know, sort of maybe city licenses, county licenses, or industry-specific licenses for that matter, if you were to sort of go into new places? Um, or maybe, you know, what is it, what do you require to go into new countries? So um, really the, the big thing to take away from this slide is, you know, you have sort of two areas, generally legal and tax, and even sometimes HR um, that are handling these, uh, but really kind of bringing it all together um, and really managing all of that um, can really be a challenge. And really to sort of expand upon that challenge, I really want to pass it over to David. Yeah, absolutely. And so as we kind of look at the next slide in terms of some of these challenges, you know, Brian noted earlier on when we talked a little bit about who CSE is as an organization, we, we do love that statistic that, you know, over 90% of the Fortune 500 use CSE for one of the services that we offer. That said, we, we certainly do want to be clear that we also service organizations of every sort of size and shape. And so from, you know, folks that are, at, I, I would say they're kind of at the beginning of the journey, maybe where they're going from being a sole proprietor to, you know, becoming a single member LLC. Uh, for example. So again, um, what I would say to that is, and how it kind of relates to what we're talking about here, is that if you are maybe a smaller organization, uh, in many cases, uh, you have individuals in the legal department that are uh, really faced with doing many things where they have to handle the entity compliance, the annual reports, they're dealing with sorts of process and litigation, they're dealing with, you know, the licenses that Brian will speak to in more detail as we go. They might be dealing with things like UCC filings, where the ultimate challenge there is that they're expected to be uh, kind of a, a jack of all trades. And, and, and again, you could appreciate how uh, difficult it might be to be kind of knowledgeable in all of these spaces, which again, are really uh, kind of unique disciplines in their own right. On the flip side, a lot of the folks that we work with are a little bit further along in sort of the continuum. They're, they're large organizations that maybe have, uh, you know, several entities or dozens or hundreds of companies. It's not just one person who's doing everything. There are multiple individuals. In some cases, like Brian talked about, there could be different departments, whether it's legal and tax or sort of classic examples that are responsible for different pieces of the puzzle. And then you get into that classic situation where uh, does the left hand know what the right hand is doing? So if there are changes in legal, is tax aware, and what are the implications? We'll kind of get into that in further detail. And so some of the challenges are just not having a complete picture of again, the total compliance uh, puzzle that you're trying to manage. Brian, can you talk to our audience about kind of what are some of the, the challenges that we commonly hear with organizations that are managing those licenses? Sure. So, from again, the license perspective, what I'm referring to are really items that are either industry-specific or city, county related. Some common terms you might hear are occupational licenses, privilege tax licenses. Some of you, you might have permits, you know, fire, alarm, health permits. Um, again, there's a sort of a huge world of licenses and kind of some of the big challenges because there's so many authorities, there's actually over 150,000 governing authorities across America, you know, having this, the ability to understand, you know, what's needed uh, to do business in certain places. Um, and really, if you don't have that, really some of the things that can occur, we fines, penalties, and some of these can even be based off of employee counts, revenue, um, you know, sometimes you can have the inability to even bid on jobs. For those of you in the trade world, uh, you might not win a bid because of that. Um, obviously, lawsuits can occur um, as a result. Uh, for some of you that have kind of a, either the hospitality world or retail space, you could actually have locations shut down uh, for not having, you know, all the licenses and permits that are really necessary from an operational perspective. Um, and one that's actually not on here, but, but does happen occasionally is that of uh, physically be, having somebody arrested. 
Uh, there are many cases where you know, managers or assistant managers actually have to be listed on particular licenses, um, which you know kind of indirectly relates to uh, you know paying fees, penalties. Um, you know, where you might have to expunge the record if it's a disgruntled employee, things of that nature. So it's really important that you know you, you have an understanding or you try to fight through the challenge of what really applies to my business based on what based on what I'm doing and where I'm doing it. And then really the final item uh, is really that of bud you know budget ownership. Um, you know, does legal own licenses? Does tax own licenses? You know, there's, we talked about kind of left hand and the right hand, but when a lot of these are kind of interconnected, they're separate, but they're interconnected, there's always an uncertainty of budgeting internally when I talk to organizations. Um, so that, that's kind of the last challenge that I would say. But I'm going to um, you know, turn it over to David for kind of the, the next part to, to start. I, we're going to move into best practices and how uh, really you, you should try to frame uh, the management of these items. And Brian, maybe one last thought before we do segue to best practices, because this just blew, again, this just boggles my mind. I, I deal mainly with what I would describe as entity management practitioners that have entities that are registered often with the Secretary of State, maybe a Department of Insurance, uh, or again, when we're dealing with organizations that are global, those entities are often, you know, uh, effectively uh, lodged with a uh, kind of a, a, a the, the country registry, so to speak, right? Company South in the UK as an example, where it's sort of the registration exists at the company, or excuse me, at, at the country level. But here you're talking about 150,000 licensing authorities is sort of uh, dizzying. And I think, Brian, you could even give me the example of uh, Pennsylvania, a state where we both grew up, where um, there's sort of all these levels. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So Pennsylvania is one of those states that where you know you have not just cities and counties, but believe it or not, you have regulatory authorities with townships, villages, boroughs, school districts. Um, you know, I always say, you know, why why does the state of Pennsylvania, the state that I grew up in, have to be the most complicated when it comes to licensing? So um, there's just so many levels of government, and that's just one example. Um, some states that are also notorious, uh, like Alabama, for example. You know, if you drive through that state or you've generated any level of, of revenue, even if you don't have any physical location or anything of that nature, they'll be they, notorious for sending people notices that they need licenses. And so the question arises again, what truly applies to me? And it's an extreme challenge. And if any of you are experiencing these, just know that you're not alone. Awesome. So with that, let's do now, let's kind of segue into what are some of the best practices for kind of handling some of the challenges that we've described. And so we're going to break this down into sort of four key areas. I and Brian and I will kind of share the responsibility of, of describing these. So we'll start with transparency. And I would think of that as just, if nothing else, visibility to what we have, right? So how many subsidiaries uh, do we have? Where are they doing business? And then Brian also talked about where, again, through the lens of licensing, now we need to understand not just where we are, but sort of what vertical are we in and what uh, you know, requirements made that introduced from a licensing perspective. And so the kind of the, the example that I would share, Brian and I attended a sales conference a couple of years back, and one of our uh, guest speakers talked about organizations that try to make decisions without information. And the analogy that he used was like golfing in the dark, where you're just kind of taking a hack at it and you really uh, are, are, are uncertain. And so I think foundationally at the start of this, it's, it's having oversight into, uh, again, just a, a picture of, your organization in terms of your your entities licenses and, and your and those those kind of related requirements and then I think Brian that kind of dovetails pretty nicely into uh, centralization which you can certainly speak to. Absolutely and, and really you know beyond that you know a lot of companies when I talk to them um, a lot of them always tell me man they would find value if there was a way to actually have all of their licenses and all of their entity information in one place. It really also piggybacks, you know, to the transparency um, and have the one-stop shop, you know, one place to see all their locations, see all of their entity information, have everything kind of synchronized together instead of having Excel spreadsheets um, or other types of, you know, Outlook reminders, but really just having all that transactional information uh, central um, in one place. And, and David, uh, I'll turn it over to you to kind of talk to sort of the security aspect of that as well. Sure, absolutely. And so obviously in, in 2020 in the world in which we live, security 
um, is often at the front of our minds because it doesn't take uh, many days to go by before you're seeing another headline about an organization that's dealing with some sort of a breach or where information may have been compromised. And so uh, I think the way to think of this is that whether you are going to look to centralize this information internally through some sort of, you know, homegrown systems or if you might look to, uh, you know, work with a partner like CSD to provide a technology solution to help, you know, centralize your, your entity and license information. And in either event, you need to think long and hard about security, really, I think, from, from two vantage points. One certainly is uh, the perspective of keeping what I'll call bad actors out of your information, making sure that there's not uh, a reasonable means for uh, a malicious third party to access your information. That's something that you certainly want to uh, put incredible, uh, really not just thought to, but, but uh, really do an assessment to understand what that looks like from a security standpoint. But then really the other perspective where security comes into play is uh, sort of the internal uh, view of it, where uh, as an organization, again, this is often a cross-departmental uh, sort of discipline, uh, should anyone be able to access everything? Or in a more likely scenario, are you looking to be able to kind of carve out what people are able to see? So maybe, for example, these folks need to be able to see core entity data, that may not need visibility to licenses, or maybe this is an individual that needs insight into certain, but not all licenses. So certainly uh, there needs to be a, a certain amount of uh, rigor applied to making sure that you have the flexibility to make sure that you're able to expose information to the right set of individuals and keep it out of the hands of people that, again, don't need access to that type of information. And so uh, I guess the, the last sort of high level best practice that we'll talk about, Brian, uh, and I'll turn it over to you, talk a little bit about knowledge. Right. So knowledge, I think, is it really is two facets of knowledge. You know, one just from a licensing perspective is going to be, you know, understanding, you know, what you need uh, proactively. So if you're going to either bid on jobs or you're going to maybe go into new markets or launch products, you know, to be proactive and try to understand, you know, what you're going to need prior to that. From an entity perspective, kind of the legal structure side, you know, once you've registered with Secretary of State offices, kind of the next step in knowledge is, well, when do I have to file my annual reports? When are they due? Um, you know, some states are going to be, be, be sort of be renewed in different frequencies. They could be based off of your fiscal year end, could be based off an anniversary month. Uh, from business license perspective, that could be quarterly. It could be semi-annually. Um, it, it could be Q1, Q4. It's all they're all over the place. So having the knowledge of really knowing, um, you know, when to manage these items is this really critical and ultimately kind of goes back to the challenges. You know, if you have these best practices in order, that should help mitigate um, any of those consequences that, that could occur. So I think what I'll do is from now is I'll turn it over. Uh, David and I would really like to dive into kind of corporate transactions, kind of the life of a business, and talk to you as to how that affects uh, entities and licenses. Yeah, Brian, absolutely. And so uh, you'll see here on the slide, and then we'll kind of dive into examples of each of these from the entity lens through the licensing lens. What are some of the kind of foundational events that may happen in the course of an organization? So formations, qualifications, where you're going into new uh, jurisdictions, uh, some maybe change examples where maybe there's a name change, officer director changes, there might be uh, some of that merger and acquisition activity that we talked about before, or kind of at the end of life scenarios where uh, maybe you're withdrawing, dissolving, liquidating, uh, or in the case of uh, kind of a physical example, you know, closing a particular location. So again, we want to kind of run through these uh, just to really kind of uh, further unpack and articulate what are some of the uh, the items to think through from the entity and the and the licensing perspective. So we'll start at the beginning. So you're forming an entity or you're taking an existing company and you're going to qualify it, i.e. register that entity into one or multiple additional jurisdictions. And so, you know, what are the impacts to, to entity compliance? At a bare minimum, and, and Brian certainly touched on this just a moment ago, at a bare minimum, one thing to think through certainly would be uh, the annual compliance obligation, which is often in the form of an annual report or, or some equivalent that's at the Secretary of State level. So, again, if it's, you know, Delaware is actually an example where things are fairly predictable. Uh, you know, annual reports are due a particular time of year for LLCs or due a different time of year for, uh, you know, for profit, you know, or inks if you prefer, uh, you know, companies that said, 
uh, in many other jurisdictions, it becomes more complicated. Uh, and Brian touched on this just again a moment ago in terms of you know when you got into the state, which would you know often be referred to as an anniversary filing, could play a part of the calculation in terms of when that annual report is due. Or again, fiscal year end of the business could also uh, be a part of that that calculation. So this gets into again that knowledge uh, question of do we have the knowledge to understand when these filings are due? It's certainly uh, you could then question, you know, do we have the resources and time to spend on these filings? But uh, for, certainly as a, a foremost question, are we even aware of some of the obligations that come as a result of these formations and qualifications? So that's just sort of a, a glimpse through the entity lens. And now, Brian, you'll kind of take us through what this might mean from the, the licensing perspective. Yeah, so once the companies are formed or you're about to expand into other states, kind of the best practice would be, you know, understanding how your business, uh, what, what licenses your business requires. Um, so let, let's say you're going to open a, okay, with the, keep with the Pennsylvania example, let's say you're going to open uh, a new location in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. You know, what is it that really applies to you? You know, are you going to have uh, vehicles driving in? Are you going to have, uh, you know, a physical sign? Are you going to have, uh, you know, outside seating if you're a restaurant? You know what actually applies to the business so um, it's really important to uh, really understand and really be proactive and identifying uh, what is actually applicable to you and for those of you that are in the trade world I think it's another good item to bring up some of you uh, through any RFPs you know when you're bidding on opportunities uh, you might to, to win the bid you might actually have to be licensed appropriately not only the individuals that are, you know, qualifying parties or people that are, you know, managing the, with the license, but the actual entity itself or an engineering firm for that matter. Um, so it's really important to really get all your ducks in a row and before you bid on that opportunity, truly understand or get all the licenses in place uh, to prevent, you know, any falling out of that opportunity. Excellent. So again, that's sort of at the starting point. We're forming, we're qualifying now. At some point, we understand that things are never static, right? There's the one constant in the world is change. And so let's look at a couple of you know, kind of a change examples. And so we have to hear where, again, there's a name change, what we're referring to as a name amendment, or maybe a director officer change. So I'll actually let Brian sort of uh, in a moment take the lead on talking about maybe what an entity name change might mean. Uh, in the world of licenses, but I'll, I'll kind of focus on the example of an officer and director change. And so I think a lot of this actually uh, comes down to where actually is the related entity uh, doing business. If we're talking about entities here in the U.S., uh, effectively, uh, I don't want to say that this is simple, but uh, by and large, the, the uh, ultimate responsibility may be something as simple as making sure that the next time you file the annual report with the Secretary of State, that you're reflecting the appropriate slate of signers, or in this case, you know, directors, officers. If we're talking about a global non-U.S. entity, then quite likely uh, the obligation is quite more uh, stringent, where in most cases you're looking to actually have to, uh, you're required to do an in-country filing with the registry, uh, again, at the country level to effectively uh, make that change official, so to speak. And then in some countries, there might be a requirement where uh, the, the minibooks, which would be the ultimate repository for the documents that uh, memorialize that change might actually have to be stored in country as well. So in terms of record keeping, in terms of filings, uh, the complexity starts to ratchet up quite a bit uh, around officer changes when you get outside of the U.S. So Brian, take us through um, maybe both of these examples from uh, how it might impact folks that are dealing with managing the licenses. Sure. So from a name amendment perspective, uh, legal entity change, uh, it's really quite imperative that the mindset be, you know, beyond the Secretary of State, you know, change. Because once that's, once that's done, you know, for example, I'll give the people that are in the insurance industry on the line, I'll, I'll give an example in that world. You know, if your agency, um, you, know, or, you know, amends the name or maybe you amend the address if you're an individual selling the insurance, you know, any amendment that you physically, you know, actually file or that occurs really needs to be reflected within 30 days across America. Um, there's some instances where uh, many instances, if you don't renew or don't you I don't you don't amend the license appropriately, for example, in the home state, then all the the non-resident states everywhere else where you're selling insurance is automatically delinquent, um, and there could be administrative actions that occur as a result of that. Um, you know, to go kind of back, um, I don't want to continue to use it, but I, I know it's one that comes to mind is the the trade example for anyone in the engineering world. Sometimes you have to list 
majority owners on licenses. Um, and again, that's just another example, but it's important that you're reflecting those appropriately. Um, you know, and so when you're, uh, when you're making these changes, you really need to look at every single level of government, no matter what type of business you're in and what type of licenses you have, because if you don't, there could be fines and penalties for not you know, reporting it in X period of time. Uh, for example, if you don't amend your address and the, ad, the license is sent to uh, your old location, some states just might automatically revoke your license uh, for you know, not updating it. So it's just really important that when these transactions occur that you are going through all the different items that you need to amend. And then, Brian, one last thought on the name change or name amendment example, and we'll get, again, toward the tail end of the presentation, we'll get more into the specifics of you know, some of the services that CSU offers in these spaces and the help that we can provide. Uh, but one of the exciting things that we're working on now is an upgrade to our platforms where we understand that in the licensing world, the, the owner, so to speak, of the license is often either a person or another company. Um, and so we're working on an upgrade that whereby if, a, if an entity is the license owner, um, that if there is a name change, that effectively it would create some alerting on our end so that we can reach out to our customers to uh, make sure they're aware of uh, some maybe license amendments that need to occur. And then the ultimate vision is to be able to, you know, surface those alerts directly to our customers as well. So we're certainly aware of the interconnection of these worlds, and we're working on some things to kind of improve um, an ability for our customers to be more proactive uh, in these spaces. So we'll, we'll talk a bit more about our services in just a little bit, but we have two more of the lifecycle examples that we want to talk through. The next one is mergers and acquisitions. And so from an entity perspective, there's a couple of different ways that you can look at this. Um, you're taking on new subsidiaries, potentially in the case of a merger or an acquisition. And so um, there's quite a lot of information that you're going to want to get your arms around in terms of understanding, you know, current place of directors, officers, so that when the, the next annual reports are coming to you, you've got that information readily available. Uh, certainly, you would want to understand the ownership uh, structures of these companies. And, and um, effectively, there are software solutions that allow you to press the button and get a visual representation, i.e. in the form of an org chart that creates that clear understanding, which, to be frank, not only is that meaningful after the, the merger acquisition is complete, but in many cases, that type of visualization would be critical in advance of a potential merger or acquisition where uh, these parties want to be able to understand actually how do things come together from an ownership standpoint. And in a lot of cases, when companies are acquiring, they're not just doing it with a pile of cash, but there's often you know, a capital element to uh, how that acquisition is taking place. So there's a lot of kind of moving pieces where, again, from a best practices standpoint, you'd want to understand kind of, again, core entity records, ownership records, certainly, and how this kind of affects your, your picture, your structure moving forward. And from a licensing perspective, uh, for the acquisition piece of it, um, there's a couple industries that come to mind to really illustrate this would be anyone in sort of the property management world or maybe uh, restaurant hospitality, whether you're acquiring locations or you're a franchisee or, um, you know, you're going to uh, purchase another organization and take on that, that ownership. It's really important to understand from a license perspective what you're taking ownership of, what's out there that now you are responsible for. And those could be alarm permits, fire permits, they could be health health permits, they could, if you have a hotel, you know, or the spa licenses, you know, in order. Um, you know, you want entertainment licenses. There's just so many things that you don't know, you may not know about from a due diligence perspective, you know, that before the deal closes, you know, it's really important to make sure that businesses have everything in order, nothing is missing. Um, and that you have everything laid out appropriately. Um, so when you do take that ownership over, um, it's really a clean slate. You don't have to worry about any uh, sort of fines or, again, penalties from the, the operational, you know, licensing side. And then to kind of wind things down on the compliance life cycle, here we are at the, kind of the, the end state where uh, we are going to dissolve an entity, uh, liquidate it, terminate it, what have you, or in the case of, uh, location, we're actually going to close a physical location. And so I think there, there will certainly be, I think, some parallels between what I described from the entity view and what Brian will talk about from the license standpoint. But effectively, it's, it's doing this correctly because at the end of the day, it is often easier to get into a state or, or form a company than it may be to dissolve it. And uh, it may be as expensive or more expensive uh, to wind it up, so to speak, because 
again, if these, if these, if the appropriate dissolution documents aren't filed uh, correctly, even though you might have thought for years, well, we've been out of that state or we've, we've, uh, you know, we've terminated that business, it still in many cases lingers on. And as a result, you haven't been filing annual reports and uh, those fees are due and delinquency fees are due on top of that. And so um, getting this right the first time and being, uh, again, very diligent around the process is critical to make sure that you don't find yourself in a, uh, a more tenuous situation when you're simply trying to close up shop in, in terms of an entity or a location. And Brian, I guess you can speak to some of the specifics from a license standpoint as well. Correct. Yeah. So it's really important, you know, after you know, David mentioned the Secretary of State physically going through that dissolution or withdrawal process, you know, the same can really be said for either physical locations or, or places where you have these industry specific or local licenses. You know, if you are, if you have not done business in that jurisdiction for three years, five years, or whatever it would be, you're still required in these jurisdiction uh, sort of eyes to still maintain the pay file. Uh, and some of those licenses are based off of revenue. Um, and then really it's just, you know, a frustrating, uh, you know, process if you fail to actually go through that cancellation because those, those authorities are going to just want to keep, you know, taking your, your money, uh, keep going through, um, you know, the process of making you renew and pay until you officially cancel. So the practice really is best uh, once you get out of those jurisdictions to truly cancel uh, the licenses holistically. Now I want to segue into uh, kind of the last major component of the webinar before we take some Q&A at the end, which is, you know, how can CSE help? So hopefully Brian and I have done a decent job of framing the conversation around some of the day-to-day -day responsibilities, some of the challenges through the lens of some of the, you know, the life cycle changes that will naturally occur. So with all that as a bit of a backdrop, how can CSE, you know, help you as an organization? And so I, I do really feel that it does start with uh, a compliance platform that we call CSE Navigator. We talked about some of the kind of the high level best practices. We talked about things like transparency, centralization, security, and knowledge. And I would argue that CSE Navigator brings all of those things to the table. Um, so effectively, uh, there are multiple solutions or multiple applications that live within the Navigator platform. So whether you're managing, you know, service of process or, or litigation, uh, we have technology in that space. Certainly we have a very powerful entity management platform that I'll take you into some detail on in just a moment. Perhaps our most popular managed service, certainly up there towards the top of the list would be our annual report preparation and filing service where um, instead of having to deal with the headache of keeping your entities in compliance with the Secretary of State for uh, really a, a simple straightforward filing fee, CSE, uh, a service fee I should say, uh, CSE can go ahead and, and really take that work off your plate and really ensure and guarantee the compliance of your entities at the Secretary of State level. Brian certainly will go into some detail around the services we offer around business licenses. Uh, but then also, as I believe I noted earlier, uh, CSE is a global organization. And so there are, in fact, over 140 different countries where CSE offers corporate secretarial services. So just as we're able to represent you here in the U.S. as a registered agent, we're able to effectively represent you as a corporate secretarial partner, again, globally in over 140 different countries. And CSE Navigator is really the platform that brings this information together so that you have that transparency, You've got that centralization. It's an incredibly secure platform, and there's even a document in our resource widget in the webinar that talks at some length about our security. And then certainly knowledge is something that we bring uh, to the table in terms of helping you understand when these different uh, events, whether they're license events or, or Secretary of State events, are uh, you know, impacting your organization. So with that, let's talk a little bit about CSE Entity Management. I could probably fill a whole webinar uh, with, with content around this. I probably have in the past, but I'll try to kind of be concise and, and, and get to the point. At the core, one of the great strengths of our entity management solution is that it sits directly on top of our navigator solution. And so in plain English, if CSE is acting as your registered agent and or if we're maybe uh, providing some services to you globally, core information for your companies will flow automatically into our entity solution. For example, the names of these companies, where they're formed and qualified, entity types, dates of registration, statuses, that information is available automatically. And also in the case of your U.S. portfolio, we have what we call a good standing calendar that automatically creates insight and can create alerts in terms of when your next set of annual filings, like annual reports, are coming due at the Secretary of State level or equivalent. That said, the reason that organizations subscribe to CSE Entity Management is because they want to build on top of that powerful foundation. They want to be able to do things like track directors and officers. They want to track ownership records, knowing that they can click a button 
and get really powerful visual org charts that create that clear understanding of how companies come together from an ownership perspective. There are some incredibly powerful document management capabilities within the application. I should note that anytime CSE does a filing for an organization, whether we have uh, you have CSE doing a formation, a name change, a withdrawal, and annual report filing, and again, that's true domestically, certainly true globally as well, we're going to automatically push documents into the system. We often call that the evidence of the filing, you know, based on work that we're doing for your organization. But for those that subscribe to the entity management platform, they also find themselves in a situation where they can upload an unlimited number of their own documents into the platform as well. We have drag and drop to make it very simple and elegant to upload documents into our system. We automatically render PDF documents searchable upon upload. So if you are a user with the appropriate permissions, uh, and I say that because you can have users that can't get the MetaBook documents, but if you are a user with appropriate permissions, you can really almost like a Google search, that's obviously that's patented trademark technology, but really you can just sort of type in in a free form fashion, a word, a name, a phrase, a date, what have you, and the application can quickly look through all of your documents. And again, not looking at just the names of the documents, but the actual context or the contents, the bodies of the documents to bring back results based on something that you're looking for. And that's just an automated capability in the platform. There's incredibly powerful reporting. So with a few clicks, you can have reports that would provide clear understanding of you know, active or historical directors, officers, list of registrations, subsidiaries, ownership records. It's a highly configurable application, so our clients can create an unlimited number of custom fields and all that information is reportable as well. And it's the second to last bullet point here, but it's sort of uh, near and dear to my heart, which is integration capabilities. So we understand that a lot of organizations do use our entity management software to be their source of truth for their legal entity data, but quite often there's a desire and a requirement to be able to take information and documents in our system and have it shared with other trusted applications inside of their uh, enterprise. So for example, they might want a tax system to be able to pull key information out of the entity platform, or they might want to be able to take uh, you know, key documents in the entity solution and feed them into uh, a document management system that might be the repository for all of their documents across their entire organization. And so we're really proud of the fact that we build our platform in a very secure way, but also in a way that can support the uh, requirement that a lot of folks have to be able to take information, again, data and documents, and effectively in an automated fashion, feed them into other parts, other systems within their organization. Thanks, David. So I know we've talked about some of the best practices and sort of challenges, and that really relates to how we can help with licenses. So for those of you that are either a new business or maybe you have existing locations and you're going into new markets or new places and you're not sure as to what's needed, we have a service called New Location Research and you would complete an industry-specific questionnaire and we'd be able to let you know what licenses are required. Uh, not, not just you know, if they have a license, but does it truly apply to you you know, are there county licenses, city licenses, township licenses? Are there state regulatory licenses based on the industry, for example? We'll provide you all the applications and give you everything that you would need from a licensing perspective. Uh, the other service, which really kind of tags to, you know, we talk about acquisitions, or maybe just that you don't have a sense that you are compliant when it comes to your licenses. Maybe you want to, you know, press the reset button and just look at your entire footprint for all of your locations or all the places where you're conducting business and see if you are in fact compliant from a licensing perspective. So a questionnaire that I alluded to would still be completed. Again, it's about two, you know, two to three pages, um, but it allows us to do a dive and uncover what's out there. Is it compliant? What's missing? Uh, have you filed everything? Or maybe you over-licensed. Maybe you filed something unnecessarily. And sometimes we find that with local authorities where companies will just file for multiple types of licenses, even though they may not need it based off a geographical location. So again, the Cliff Notes version of that existing research is that it's going to tell you what you have, what you don't have, and what you have but you don't need. So you know, moving on, you know, we can also help with amendment research if there's officer changes, ownership changes, we can you know, do that analysis to see how to amend those as well. But really the capstone of our service falls under the actual management of the licenses. So you know, to go back to our theme of best practices, we talked about transparency, centralization, you know, and security, um, and the knowledge. And so with, our, our, your, with the service, you would actually get a dedicated contact, a knowledgeable uh, business license expert who would be responsible for managing the licenses. We'd let you know the 60 days ahead of time as to what was coming up 
We would proactively prepare the licenses. Uh, we would advance the, the governing bot the fee. We you know, cut checks for it or use our credit card if we could do it online. And then ultimately after we file it, we would actually uh, update the portfolio within your account through CSC Navigator. And then we would send the actual licenses either to you or to your physical locations with posting instructions. So that would be how that process would work. And then we would send you a monthly bill um, afterwards based on the licenses that we, we completed. So just really to summarize, it's not just kind of a service, but it's the technology of what we're going to manage behind the scenes. And uh, what I will show now really is just kind of screenshots you know, of how the licenses would actually be housed. Um, so you'll see in a couple moments um, the actual you know, grid showing the expiration dates, the file numbers, the little pieces of paper on the left are the actual copies of the licenses. Uh, but ultimately this would be how we would store them, yet manage them on our end, again, giving you that centralization, that transparency, and that world-class secure environment.